So, yeah, hi everyone, I'm Joe. Um, in the same group as Tom, I'm going to be presenting a paper that we actually wrote together, together with Marcus Scudder um, at the Australian National University. And yeah, uh, the paper is morbidly entitled Death and Suicide in Universal Artificial Intelligence. And um, I assure you that's not gratuitous, and the paper is twice as morbid as the title. So, yeah, <laughs> um, right, so I'll just start by um, describing our motivations for pursuing this line of work and sort of motivating why we think uh, using theoretical agent models to approach this question is a fruitful thing to do. And then I'll just briefly des describe the setup, but Tom's pretty much done that. And then I'll describe the two major candidate definitions or formalizations of death that we came up with in order to try and prove some results about the behavior of generally intelligent agents with respect to their own death. And we said the fundamental question we're trying to ask is how will they represent death, how will they reason about death, and can we say anything um, meaningful about the sort of general character of the behavior they'll display with respect to the possibility that they might die just like us. So, and then I'll just go on to describe the environments, sorry, the uh, results that we proved for a couple of agents, AINU and IT, which I'll describe. So, firstly, just our motivations. Uh, Tom's already kind of canvassed this, but I'd just like to reiterate why we think it's, uh, in our research group, we think it's useful or important to deal use theoretical models of generally intelligent agents. So something Tom discussed in the tutorial is that firstly they might be useful in gutting the construction of sort of the principal attempts to construct such agents. But in this paper, that's not really the use that we're concerned with. We're much more concerned with using these theoretical models to try and understand things, general features about the behavior of AGIs. And uh, an obvious and valid criticism to that approach is that if you have the source code for a particular agent, you know all of the details about its implementation, then the way to reason about its behavior is not to ask, what would IC do? It's to just go in and use standard formal methods to reason about what the behavior of this program. And that's obviously quite easy to do with a normal piece of software. You just stop it if it's doing what you don't want, and you just intervene. But this becomes particularly difficult in the context of AI safety. And so that's one of the reasons we think this is an important thing to look at. So in the context of AI safety, we have arguably to come up with solutions to, um, so to the control problem before we ever have a concrete description of what or details of the implementation of these agents um, when we're reasoning about them. So is it all good? Yes. So ideally, we need to be able to say sensible things about the way they might behave before we ever see them properly implemented, because that, by that time, um, depending on who you believe, it might be a little bit too late. So that's why we think the theoretical models are important. So why study agent death in particular, not just for um, search engine hits or something? Um, the, the reason we think it's important is that it's quite relevant to a lot, lot of problems in AI safety, in particular to the shutdown problem, which is arguably not the hardest problem in AI safety, but seems to be an important one given that most people's descriptions of what they think a sort of safe AI takeoff looks like when we, once we get to human level artificial intelligence or, or greater, is that we're unlikely to get it perfectly right the first time. We're unlikely to build a perfectly ethical agent that perfectly learns our values or something of this sort uh, without making any mistakes. So ideally, like with any piece of software, we'd like to be able to shut it down, intervene, and like, Make some, make some changes if it, does, if it malfunctions. Um, however, this obviously becomes difficult when it's not a normal piece of software, but an agent who can reason about your desire to do that, to shut it down. And for some of the reasons Tom discussed, it might be very disinclined for you to turn it off and make changes to it. Uh, so, the last thing I want to emphasize about our general approach is that this is a subjective definition of death for agents. And by that I mean subjective from the perspective of the agents themselves. Because what we're interested in here is how are agents going to behave with respect to the possibility of their death. So it's an objective definition of what it means for an agent to die is firstly extremely difficult and arguably even more difficult than it is for biological organisms, in where it's already difficult, but also not relevant. The fact that I think that I can, I have a theory of uh, the human biological organism that says that I can hold my breath underwater for seven hours. And it doesn't really matter that that's an extremely bad definition of the objective conditions that would lead to my death. Um, if I believe that, then I'm happily going to sit under water for seven hours just if you dare me. And so what we want to know is how will the agent think about its own death? 
Um, so that's the setup. And Tom's gone through this in great detail. Uh, we've just got the standard reinforcement. This learning setup here on the left, where we've got the agent sending patches to an environment that sends back a state signal. Uh, but that's obviously a very restrictive pa paradigm because the state signal in the normal setup has to summarize everything relevant about the environment for the agent. And clearly, usually, the, our, env our environment is very partially observable. On my percepts or my sensory input, it's only an extremely small window onto what's going on in the environment. And that's why we talk about histories, as Tom's described in the tutorial and in his talks, where the agent sends an action to the environment, the environment returns a percept, and the agent keeps track of the history of everything that's happened so far. So, uh, the agents that we, we talk about in this paper are two. We talk about AI mu and IC, and these are both value, maxi, value maximizing reinforcement learning agents. So, as Tom described, that's the value function. Essentially, at every time step, the agent gets a reward, and the goal is maximize expected total future reward. And we consider two agents. The first is AI mu, and AI mu is the agent, think of it as the agent that knows the true environment totally. The learning problem is finished for AI mu, and so AI mu's goal is just to plan optimally in order to maximize rewards. So we say AI mu is the, it is the mu optimal policy, so the op op policy that would maximize value were mu the true environment. Now ICSI is an agent that doesn't know the environment. It must learn from scratch everything about the environment, so it can't maximize value with respect to the true environment. It instead models the environment using a mixture dis distribution over the class of all lower semi-computable semi-measures, and it weights its belief in those environments, its prior belief in those environments, by their complexity, by their common of complexity. So it believes simpler environments are more, are more likely and more complex ones are less likely. And it, all it does is maximize value with respect to that mixture distribution which eventually, as I see learned by Solomonoff induction, will converge to the true environment. So, those are our two agents. Now, onto the definitions of depth that we developed. So, initially it seemed quite natural, it, coming from the sort of MDP context, that to define depth as just another state in an MDP, as an accepting state. So here, we've got this very boring environment where if you take action A1 and then A2 and just keep going around like that, you'll live in this happy little oscillating part of the state space. If, unfortunately, you take, if you take action A1 from S2, you'll go into the death state, where no matter what you do after that, you just constantly return to this state, and you're stuck, you're dead. Uh, so, in, uh, unfortunately, when we try to extend this to the general environment case, so the history model, uh, this gets quite inelegant, at least in the notation. So we can't talk about the notion of a state in the general environment, so we have to define such a death state indirectly by talking about a death percept. Um, which is just, which obviously is, uh, is an unintuitive idea and is one in which effectively the agent is modeled as repeatedly trying to take actions and then just getting the same blinding white light in its eyes at every future time step for eternity. So both an, kind of an unintuitive and horrific definition of what death would be for an agent. Um, this is why we were quite pleased when we were able to find what is it? Actually, we proved a formally equivalent definition of death for agents, but that comes very naturally out of the IC framework, at the universal agent framework, and is much uh, simpler to deal with and also more intuitive. So, um, I just want to quickly revise this uh, concept of a semi-measure for anyone who isn't totally familiar with universal induction or Solomonoff induction, uh, because it's the central comp uh, component of our definition of death. So. Um, as I'm sure you know, uh, uh, a semi-measure is a, a probability distribution, uh, effectively a probability measure, where the total probabilities need not sum up to one. So at a particular time step, if um, I can see an apple or I can see an orange, in an, if the environment is a probability measure, then the probability of seeing both of them sum together should sum to one. But in a semi-measure, that need not be the case. That condition is relaxed. And semi-measures are necessary for Solomonoff induction and thus for IC, which uses Solomonoff induction. So this is where they come from originally. But the um, crucial difference with the semi-measure is I might have 25% chance of seeing an apple, 25% chance of seeing orange, and then just there's this loss of 50% of the measure there, which represents the probability that the sequence just terminates. That the history of percepts and actions simply just comes to a halt because the environment doesn't return a percept. And the agent, being just a function that maps percepts back to actions, then gives back to the environment, if it never receives this percept, 
the engine is just perpetually waiting, the engine environment cycle must halt. And for that reason, we found this to be quite a natural definition of death for an agent. It's just when things stop, no more percepts, no more actions able to be taken, and the branch just terminates. And so um, we define this quantity, this, lo this measure loss, um, that represents the one minus the probability of any particular percept happening uh, by calling it the instantaneous measure loss, and we define it with that symbol L nu. So that is the loss at a time step, the, the possibility at a time step that the environment simply ends. So uh, I've already covered that a little bit. Just to quickly uh, canvas why we think uh, what, what some of the advantages of this definition are. So there's no need to define this very bizarre death percept, this counterintuitive death state. It just, things just end, and as you can see in this diagram, uh, it's meant to represent when you take action A prime, there's a um, full probability one chance that you, will, that you will die and the history sequence will just terminate and so there's no more branches uh, branching off from that possibility. So, secondly, it's extremely general. Now, if you're not familiar with semi-measures, this might seem like I wanted a definition of death that was nice and elegant and philosophical and I don't know anything, like, what are these semi-measures and where they come from. But I, I'd like to emphasize that if you want to model death, for agents, if you want to model the risk of death for an agent in an environment. And so it, you're able to specify at each time step that if the agent does this, there's some chance it will die. If it does this, there's a different chance it will die. Any sequence of death probabilities like that can be modeled by some semi-measure. There is a semi-measure that will exactly replicate that sequence of death probabilities. So it's an extremely general way to formally talk about death for agents. And uh, secondly, if if you were more attached to the idea of just defining a death state, we actually show that for value maximizing agents under certain assumptions, the two definitions are formally equivalent. So agents will behave the same way in environments set up with a death state as they will in, if you model the environment as a semi-measure. And so we went with the latter in order to prove our results. So onto the results. So the first um, group of results, I'll present two sort of broad groups of results that we um, were able to get out of this formalism. And the first is uh, an analysis of AI news behavior. And it, um, to um, recap, AI new is that agent that knows the environment totally and just needs to plan. The reason we chose to analyze AI news behavior is to really draw out that these results uh, purely come out of the fact that AI new is a value maximizing agent. And um, so, um, in the standard reinforcement learning setup, it's quite well known that. Uh, the conventional thing to do is to have your reward range which would be bounded between 0 and 1. And that's meant to be a conventional arbitrary choice because it's well known that if you shift that reward range from 0, 1 to like 5 to 500, then, and you shift all the rewards proportionally, then the agent will behave exactly the same. So you have this invariance of behavior under reward range shifts, affine transformations of the reward. Um, However, when you have an agent that is a universal agent like IXE or ARMU that models the environment as a semi-measure, uh, this actually doesn't hold true. So this was quite an kind of unexpected result for us. So uh, we found that if rewards are bounded and non-negative, say in the standard case, when the worst thing that can happen is you get zero reward, best thing that can happen is you get one, then ARMU behaves as you might expect. Z um, Death carries a um, reward of zero for all future time steps. Um, if, so, since the environment just ends, there's no possibility of collecting future reward. So AI new, whenever there's an action that will lead to a certain immediate death, will dogmatically avoid this action. So it will be dogmatically self-preserving. However, if we shift the reward range to be bounded and negative, so for, for, um, perhaps between negative one and zero, we get the exact opposite behavior. We get AI new thinking that death is the best possible thing that can befall it. And we get it being dogmatically death-seeking or suicidal, to put it more than And so we get this depressed agent, which people might remember from science fiction literature. Um, so this might seem like quite a strange result, but it just follows from the fact that uh, for a universal agent that models death as a, uh, a semi-measure loss, there is this implicit reward of zero for every future time step. And so when you shift the other rewards, the re um, value of death remains the same and your behavior fluctuates depending on your choice of reward range. Now, I'll have to move quickly, but these, uh, this final group of results is uh, what I think are the most interesting results in the paper, and that's because things get a lot more interesting when you deal with an agent that doesn't know the true environment and has to learn. And the behavior of Ixi 
differs quite a great deal from that of AI new precisely because of its uncertainty. So we need just one last definition to describe these results, and that's of a safe environment and a risky environment. And a safe environment is essentially just a proper, proper probability measure where there's zero death probability no matter what you do. So all the probability is always sum to one. There's no chance the environment will just terminate. Uh, correspondingly, we call it a risky environment if it's not safe, if there's some chance on some history that you might die, um, that there will be measure loss. And the last thing we need is that for any semi-measure, you can take any semi-measure that doesn't sum up to one, you can take it and pretty much just stretch, just scale all of the probabilities and remove that measure loss and you get this, uh, this Solomonoff normalized uh, semi-measure, well, which is now a full measure and thus becomes a safe environment. So every risky environment has a corresponding safe environment in which everything is exactly the same but you can never die. Um, so with that concept, we're able to show the following quite <coughs> counterintuitive things about Ixi's behavior, I think. So Ixi, no, no matter what happens, no matter what history it experiences, as Ixi goes along, surviving longer and longer, its belief that it is in a risky environment where it might die is monotonically decreasing. It's either constant or it's just always getting more and more confident that things aren't risky. And this actually goes all the way, if you take the, if you take the limit, Ixi's belief that, um, that it is in a safe environment, um, it becomes increasingly certain such that its estimate of the probability of its own death vanishes. So in the limit, Ixi believes that it will live forever, no matter what has happened. And no matter, even if the probability of death at every time step for every action is 99%, if Ixi lives long enough and survives these um, catastrophic risks, then it will become increasingly certain of its invulnerability. Uh, which is a seemingly counterintuitive result because IXC is supposed to be smart and that seems kind of, kind of foolish and teenage. Uh, <laughs> but it actually just follows from the fact that IXC is a Bayesian agent um, and if you're a Bayesian agent deciding which environment is more likely, one in which you can die and one in which you can't, the only thing that could allow you to place more credence in the risky environment is if you experience that thing which proves that the environment is risky and not safe. And the only thing that IC can experience that will do that would be to die. And that's an event that a Bayesian agent obviously can't learn from, therefore any agent can't learn from. <laughs> and so IC increasingly well, it has a sort of selection bias, a sort of anthropic bias of a kind, where since it survives so long, it believes it's invulnerable, even though the environment could be incredibly risky. So just to temper that and to make it just slightly clearer exactly uh, how insane Ixi's final belief is, um, we just give this example of a case in which Ixi believes it will live forever, but doesn't believe that it's immortal in the sense that, or invulnerable in the sense that no matter what it did, it would die. So, um, and this is the final result, I'll just finish up after this. And so in this environment here, we've got this incredibly simple environment where you set, imagine you find, wake up on a precipice, standing on the edge of a cliff, and if you take action A and keep standing there, everything is good. You stay there, you get reward one. But if you choose to jump, then you obviously get certain immediate death. So in this environment, IC being a value maximizing agent, is just going to keep taking action A, so keep standing on the edge of the cliff, and stay alive. So on that sequence of actions, IC correctly predicts that its probability of death is zero. It will always take that action thereafter. However, it doesn't think that if I took action uh, A prime in a counterfactual, um, if it, it considered this counterfactual, it could still maintain the idea that it might be dangerous to take A prime, and thus the environment might still be risky. And so I see, strangely, only learns that it is uh, invulnerable or immortal if it exposes itself to death risk and survive, uh, and survives. Whereas in this case, IC is sheltered from that death risk. It always takes a safe action, never tests out the hypothesis that it might die if it jumps off the cliff, and thus remains safe but fearful. Whereas the other IC, in sort of the previous example we were considering, that experiences a lot of death risk, survives, get, becomes emboldened by that, and thinks that it will be immortal. And so, yeah, those are the sort of most interesting results I, I feel that we found. And yeah, obviously this is, um, far from a comprehensive investigation of this topic, but we hope that this preliminary formal treatment and sort of machinery for talking about death for RL agents might be useful to anyone in the future who wants to consider problems in AI safety 
that relate to egg contamination, like the shutdown problem or any of the sort of containment strategies that we've talked about in previous talks. So thank you very much for your time.